Okay. Sure, everybody's ready to go. Uh, my name is Bob Sara. Um, welcome to this afternoon's uh, talk on Security 101. Uh, this is Mr. David Dumas. Uh, this is profession. This is presentations for security professionals who will address how to apply network infrastructure to an infrastructure networks that require protection. This is uh, Security 101. David is very good at what he does. Uh, Dave Dumas is a distinguished fellow and a senior network security engineer working for the chief security officer of the Verizon Wireline Security Operations Group. His current work involves outsourcing, offshoring, federal regulations, cybersecurity, and privacy regulation, customer business presentations, and he is a Verizon representative on the outside committees. David was the director of the Verizon's network security architecture and design for nine years prior to his role. In that role, he led efforts on network security, PKI, file security, security governance, and risk assessment. Previously, David held positions at Digital Equipment Corporation for 14 years, established a security consulting practice. David is an author and presenter on the topic of security networks. He has 27 years in the field of security, and his background is in computer science and security consulting. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. David Dumas. This is more chairs in the if you guys want. You want to stand up here? Not that one, because that looks like a dumbass chair. But it's, it's <laughs> um, welcome. It sounds like I, I built this out of for what the people in the room wanted to do, and thanks to the folks that did stop by the ISSA table and, and asked what this talk was all about. I hopefully I explained it. I have 38 slides, so I'm going to move pretty quick. Bob just mentioned this one, so now we're down to 36. Um, when I originally started putting this stuff together, I said, how do we get more security profession, professionals into the field? Because there's a lot of criminal professionals out there. We need to even up the odds. And so I said, well, we've got to start explaining to people, young and old. I've talked to high schoolers, um, I'm talking to you folks as adults. We need more security professionals out there. And, and they constantly will come by me and say, how do I get into the field? What should I be studying? This is my business. What should I be looking for? So, so take this slide deck, and uh, if, you, if you want a copy of it, then just send an email to me, um, davidwinsurprising.com. Send it to .net, it goes to another person. Um, that's what happens when you have 10 million people using ISP. Um, and uh, take and go through every one of these slides. The references are on the slides. Every one of the keywords, if you don't know what they are, Google them, figure out what they are, use Wikipedia, things like that. And just learn more about the field so you can talk intelligently to whatever you're doing, to your developers, to your product people, to your infrastructure, how to protect your own home network. So we're going to go through a lot of this stuff, we're going to go through it pretty quickly, but you're going to go back through this stuff and get a better idea. So when I built a course, a three-hour course that I did out of California this spring, I gave them uh, homework assignments. This is one of yours. So uh, you have two questions to answer. For the company you work for, what would be the five things someone wants to steal? You need to know the answer to that, because that's what they're going to go after, and that's what you want to protect the most. You can't protect everything. Want to protect the most because the end game is now they're probably in your network they're trying to go for those five things you need to know what they are and you need to protect them better we're going to talk a little bit about how to do that all right the end game used to be use firewalls into virus and ids and all of that stuff and you're going to be fine they haven't getting past your perimeter they're probably past the perimeter so the end game now is to find them as quick as you can and root them out before they steal those top five things okay that's that's the new game and, and that's why we need more security professionals the other thing is uh, in your home networks, what are the five things you want to protect in your home networks? For instance, you want your financial bank account information, you want to make sure that that is um, not stolen, uh, your videos of your kids, all of that stuff. Whatever you think is the most important in your home network, um, your disk space is important because if someone's running a legal business, they might want to put their child porn on that disk, things like that. So uh, you don't want that knock on the door from the FBI saying uh, you have child porn and you had nothing about it. but you had an open connection to the internet, they use your disk space in order to store their stuff. So, you, um, so take that seriously. Um, know what you need to protect because you can't protect everything. And that's a good homework assignment for you. The other homework assignment I'll give you is to read the Verizon Data Breach Report, which I have some slides on. 
Uh, really good read, and I'll summarize that too in this talk. So we've been around for about 20 years, this thing called the internet. I was talking to high schoolers and realized that every one of them there was born um, after the internet started. So I really started feeling old when I did that, but um, but it's been, uh, it went from 3 million users to 2.3. That's a billion, that's, 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 that's a lot of people. So this internet has really taken off. Um, I'm hearing things called industrial internet coming up now and, and things like that. It may be to the point where the internet itself becomes hard to do business on and we may go to a second network and do some of that stuff. And that's where we really apply a lot more security to it. Uh, this was never designed to be secure. We've had to um, fix a lot of the protocols over time. So why do the criminals like this place? It's, it's a beautiful place. There's no, there's no taxes. There's no laws. Uh, you can rob the bank from anywhere in the world. Um, so for a lot of reasons, um, they're actually kind of pissed off because it's not fast enough to steal all the stuff that they want to get it all fast enough. That's how much money they're making around the world on stealing from the internet. The United States has been a, a prime target to steal from because we're so well connected. We have almost everything online. So um, they can do it from this safe haven as well. Uh, how much can they make? Uh, the, uh, the biggest thing is to get something called a zero-day exploit. What that means is that there's no patch against whatever it is, so that if you're running that software and they have uh, an exploit for it, you never even know that they hit you. And so that's why zero days are more valuable. So if you have a zero day against a Microsoft operating system, it's worth $50,000 in today's money. That's a lot of money. Uh, for, uh, for some countries, that may be two or three years worth of salary. Uh, when you get down into these things, these used to be worth a lot more money. Now there is so much identity theft going on that you really can't make a lot of money in that stuff. So, so people are really going up into this area to make a uh, decent amount of money. Um, so it's out there. Um, these are some of the numbers. Excuse me. Yeah, how, how did you came up with these numbers? Uh, this was part of this study here. Um, so uh, it was related to the fraud stuff. And um, I think I got the slides from a guy within Verizon. So my, my suggestion is to just, on each one of these things, sort of Google the first two or three words in it, and you'll find the actual corpus reference. I know the bottom half, you can go to Pastebin and actually look at advertisements for people selling the stuff. Yeah. See what they're asking. Yeah. It's, it's, it's to the point where um, Black hole uh, premium is probably one of the most used uh, exploit tips that are out there. It costs $10,000 a month to run. You say, oh, crap. That's $120,000 a year to run my illegal business. But all I have to do is create, uh, you get some free zero day exploits on it. So you can just go out and just broadcast it across the world. And all you have to do is get 200 people to click on it, infect them, and then just with like ransomware, just encrypt the disk and just say, if you give me $50, I'll decrypt your disk and go away. You have all your kids' pictures back or your work PC back. You say, well, that's worth $50 and we'll get that back to your PC, maybe $500. Um, all they have to do is get uh, you know, 200 people to do that and they've got the $10,000. And then they can use the rest of the time to steal intellectual property and do stuff like that and make you know, $20,000, $40,000 that month. So it's a real business for a lot of people. And you get full-time 24 by 7 support when you buy this. So it's a, <laughs> it's a valid business, and, and they're making lots of money. That's right. So it's, it's pretty scary um, uh, how much of this stuff has changed uh, from two or three years ago. If you talk about, I saw this report, this report happened in the spring, and it was just amazing to show that this level of intelligence is out there. So at, this is a, the Red October exploit, and um, Kersky Labs actually put this out there, and uh, they stole seven tr uh, terabytes worth of data over five years, and it was just let known now as to what they were doing. The interesting thing in all of this is, if you take a look at some of the gray areas, these are the areas that weren't actually compromised. And so, um, I'm not pointing to any one country, but uh, there, there may be some countries <laughs> that, that could potentially have been involved in this in some capacity. You know, I, I don't think that up here these cold, cold climates, there's too much going on. They may not even have any of that up there. But, um, <laughs> um, but um, the reality is that um, uh, this happened over a five-year span, and we just figured it out now. And most people don't even keep logs past a year. So you wouldn't even be able to tell that it even happened to you because that was five years ago. So um, 
one word of caution, if you aren't carrying enough logs, you need to start carrying your logs for, for many, many years, because they can be in there for two, three, five years before you even know you've been compromised. And you, so you need to know a little bit more about that. So, uh, a little plug for EMC, by some more just. The fire hydrant report, this came out this spring too. I thought this was interesting in that uh, this area right in here, it, they analyze, this is their data because they analyze malware, 89 million events, and uh, all across all organizations on average, you are attacked every three minutes. So they're persistent, they're out there, they're constantly doing it, and as security professionals, we have to be better than they are. That's really hard because they just have to find one problem, you have to defend the whole network. Uh, in our case, we're in 150 countries. Uh, it's really hard to keep that network tight. Um, in my group alone, we have 120 professionals. So, so anyways, uh, take a look at these reports that come out from a lot of vendors that deal with malware, deal with intrusion. So just take a look at what's happening in the industry. That's why we need more security professionals because the battle's changing. And um, uh, let me tell you a quick story. Um, I, I did a, um, a cyber talk at a uh, healthcare company last year, uh, they had uh, computer security week. And um, I thought, you know, I had one hour to talk about security and started getting a little excited about it and it was after lunch so I know they're all gonna be dreary. But well, the person who talked before me was the senior PP in the organization. And he stood up there like this and before I get up, and he looked at everybody in the room, there's like eight people, and they all worked for him. He said, if we have an exploit in this company, you no longer have a job because the company folds. They all sat up after that and listened to me. It was amazing. <laughs> it was like, they thought I was a guru. No, the reality was they're in the healthcare field. They have uh, uh, 160 employees. Um, and if the reputation, if they knew that they were compromised, the next year when those contracts become for renewal, they could go to alternate vendors. Therefore, their business goes down, 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 down. So a small, medium business, they can't handle very many of these exploits. So, so he was telling them the truth, but the reality is everybody that works for a company that gets really, really compromised um, may not be working there. Um, the Saudi Aramco stuff, once they figured out what they wanted to steal over there, they wanted to create a diversion to try to steal the stuff and get it out because they found out that they had been, uh, people knew that they were in. They created a diversion by working 30,000 servers. 30,000 systems they worked. Think about, from an IT point of view, how long it would take you to build 30,000 systems. That's the level of sophistication that you're willing to go through to do something. So that's why we need more security professionals, because we get to get ahead of all of this. So what this talk is going to do is going to do one slide on each one of these areas. Um, and we're just going to hit it real quick, like, and I'm not going to go through a lot of the slides, but they're there. If there's a homework assignment, you can send me an email, I'll send you the slides. Okay? Is full security very important? If they get access to the system, they have it. It's that simple. It's just a question of time. They can put in a, uh, a CD of another operating system and boot it back up again, get to the disk itself, uh, do whatever they need to do. They carry it up. They can spend a lot of time with it. If it's too big to carry out, they'll try to compromise in different ways. But people's security is really important. The, the most compelling thing that I heard lately was they said, if you ignore the users, You've already lost the battle in the battlefield. Because the users are your eyes and ears to see what's going on. They know what's not normal. How come my system's running so slow? How come my, uh, this application goes blue screen on me? Uh, they know, they, they sense when the network's not right. And if they report it to IT, maybe that's a hint that something went wrong in the network. Someone's doing something that they shouldn't be doing. So never forget physical security. We hear out in these really ugly buildings in every town they call central offices. That was our perimeter for a long period of time, um, was these concrete bunkers we put our switches in. The reality is now today, um, we're just broadcast around the world. A lot of our stuff now is in data centers and not central offices, but they're still there everywhere. Uh, so this goes important going to People security, um, vet who you have in the company, it's really important. Um, we do background checks, we've done drug testing, all of that stuff. Um, uh, exchange information, you're seeing a lot more of this with the, uh, the presidential executive order for sharing information between the government and the private sector. But there's still, there are a lot of laws out there. So for instance, my company can't share directly with the government because we'd be breaking the law. 
So we can do it under a subpoena when they ask us for specific information, but we can't just locally share back and forth. So some of those laws have to change in order for these uh, executive orders to work. But the reality is um, we do a lot of sharing with a lot of different companies, uh, a lot of different uh, types of organizations that are out there, uh, depending on what's going on. Uh, that good looking guy up there is me. Uh, part, part of uh, uh, my job is I have to cross, uh, uh, cross train for other types of jobs. So. Uh, if the union decides to go on strike, which they did about a year and a half ago, um, that's that would be me climbing poles and doing stuff. And, stuff. and I don't even like heights, but you know, sometimes you have to do that. Uh, so, um, who do we interact with in, in my company? Um, these are some of the organizations uh, we work with. Um, just want to put a plug in for some of these local organizations. ISACA um, is here. Um, ISC squared. Um, so, if you have a CISSP certification, which is Something that is, uh, it gets you through the resume uh, to the first level, so you maybe get a phone interview uh, if you're you know, trying to get in the security field. So getting at least one certification, even if it's a, a Cisco certification or something, it shows um, that you want to be a security professional and, and you want to uh, match up. You have to get past the HR department and the computers first before you can even get the phone interview, before you get the job interview. So, so it's important to, to do some of that stuff. Down here, I belong to the uh, multi-state ISAC, which is a group of, uh, uh, a lot of times, governments and vendors, and we work together on things that are happening across the states in the United States. Um, so that, that's another good one over here. Um, ISSA, I've been sitting at the group all day. Some of you folks have come up and, and said hi, and um, uh, just a group of security professionals. So there's a lot of things. I gave a talk at IEEE two weeks ago um, on something associated with this too. The laws are changing around the world. Uh, it's a very, very uh, complex thing for me to try to keep track of because we're in 150 countries. <clears throat> Even when I do write, we write a policy that matches to the regulation. Um, I have to have it translated to that country's language, and I, I hope that they did a good job with translation because <laughs> I can't read it after that. Uh, for example, when I do one for Greece, it's in Greek, and it's definitely a different font and, and, and language than that. I don't even know what it said after it got translated. I just hope it. They did a good job on it, but, um, but there's a lot of uh, private. It's driving, privacy is driving a lot of the regulations around the world right now. You're seeing it also in the United States too. But as people become computer savvy, they will have computer cyber laws. They will have privacy laws. Uh, just doing bad guys stealing things. Um, so I have to keep track of that. The presidential executive order. Um, we're really busy making sure that they um, don't think that the ISP can solve world hunger. Um, in the, there is responsibility across the ecosystem for security. It's not just the ISP that has the pipe that enables a lot of this stuff to happen. So we, I've been working a lot with that. Um, you have to follow the laws and regulations of the land that you do business in. Um, so you, you have to do those things or else you get fined some penalties and your reputation as a company goes downhill. Um, so keep track of them. Uh, legal up wherever you can because your lawyers should be your best friends. Uh, security training, uh, really important. Uh, I'll get one bullet here, which is cyber tabletops. Usually one, one cyber tabletop a year in my company. Um, and uh, <laughs> I used to think when I was writing it that I was thinking very deviously about you know what could go wrong in the network. And, and when I read some of the things that have happened in the last year, I said, well, I'm, I'm not even down in the weeds of being devious compared to what some of the people have actually done. So um, it, it's out there. Um, one of the things that um, we learned from the latest one was that if we think our network is compromised, how do we use it to communicate because bad people may be reading our email, bad people may be watching my file transfers as we try to recover and thwarting all of our efforts. Um, so that was an interesting takeaway. And then the other one was, well, if our network is really, really compromised, how do we communicate and get together on the outside of all networks and then come back in and do the repair? So that's one of, the, one of my projects I'm working on this year is to figure out how to, an internal and an external way of communicating if things really go bad. And trust me, if they go bad in my company, they're going to go bad in your company, too. Because um, if I know it works out working here, so it's not in a lot of cases. So, um, so we're thinking along those lines now just to figure out, based off the Saudi Aramco type of a thing, um, you know, what could be some bad things that would take place and how do we recover from it as quick as possible. And we do that really good on physical security, like in the Hurricane Sandy, we had to replace 10,000 telephone poles. That's a lot of telephone poles. The logistics to get all those trees there, get them ready, put them up, put the new wires on them, uh, and do it as quick as possible. So um, 
we're capable of doing it, but the cyber side of that is now a challenge. And people need to start to think about how do I recover my business if something like that was to happen. So I'm like a homework assignment for you. Uh, this came out of the multi-state ISAC, and it's just a, a good awareness type training that you can get to your users. If you get onto the mailing list, these come out like once a month. You can just put your new company logo on it, send it back out again, <laughs> get some scary awareness now. Um, and uh, there's some good ideas in here. Phishing is trying to get someone to social engineering someone to do something that they wouldn't normally do, like click on a link and get infected, and then they're already inside the company. So uh, we'll talk about that. Some security terms. I mentioned ransomware. There's a lot of things up there. Uh, advanced persistent threat is one that you definitely should look up and understand. It's really more of an advanced persistent adversary. When someone just uh, gets in, hunkers down, in most cases they're spies who are trying to take intellectual property and put themselves on those lines. The real juicy stuff you have, the Coca-Cola formula you're working for, Coke stuff like that. They're looking for the, the stuff that can really make them a lot of money. And then uh, down in here, there's a lot of different things. I don't know if anybody knows what water holding is, but think of uh, you know the zebras in Africa. They're really thirsty, and they, it's, it hasn't rained in 100 days, and they're going to the water hole, and the lions are just waiting for the weak one to call up the herd. Well, it's the same thing on the internet, and basically, they see something big happening and it's going through CNN's publicizing it. They'll infect CNN, so anybody that goes to that website gets infected. So it's the same analogy, they call it water pulling. But. So we have a geeky cyber terms for the same things that happen in uh, the real world. Uh, but there's a lot of terms here, Google, look them up. Uh, these are some security resources for people who come by the ISIS, I guess, and say, how do I get into this? This is what I uh, look at and read uh, on a pretty religious basis. Um, I'm getting some pretty good feeds from the, the Department of Homeland Security on the difference that are going on and the FBI. Um, so they are now starting to share more information. Um, the good thing about it is it's more actionable information. And what that means is it's no longer good enough just to say um, this IP address. You have to have the IP address with the exact timestamp of that IP address. Because this malware is constantly fluxing their IP addresses. So you have to know that instant in time, that place in the world, this was the IP address that was used. Um, so that um, they're now, they've now figured out from the US government point of view that actionable data is more valuable than, you know, because you don't want to, as a, uh, as a company, to go out and shut off someone that, that wasn't even their IP address that they were using. Um, you could be hurting their business, or it could be a home address, and, and, that, uh, and the person has a heart monitor and things like that. So you get into all these messy lawsuits. and. So you really have to know who you're dealing with I mean, so that, that time stamp's really critical. Now the U.S. government has figured that out. But um, the ISA, ISSA journals up there, different magazines, all of this stuff is free. Um, so take a look at some of it. Don't inundate yourself with incoming spam every day, but it's nice to know what's going on and the level of magnitude of what's going on. And especially if, it, let's say, there's a new uh, exploit and you're in the electric sector, you need to know about it. If you're in the water sector, you need to know about it. Um, got some guys. Uh, Hanging out on the Quabbin Reservoir uh, over the last week or so. Chemical engineers at midnight. Uh, okay, not from this country. So, um, you know, so we just have to think that you know, you know, we had some terrible things happen here in the marathon, and uh, um, they're out there. Uh, so our jobs as professionals is to try to keep our companies running and viable. And um, get the thing different. This was a horrific time in most people's lives. It was 911. Um, we lost a number of employees from that plane hit there. We lost some employees from the, What happened here was these two buildings collapsed, which is what you see here. But what happened was World Trade 7 collapsed in this building here. This building here is 140 West Street, which was the largest CO in, in, in uh, downtown Manhattan. Uh, so, the wiring, so the wiring rack looked like this. And this is all the cables coming in that are connecting up Wall Street. Like, like that. We had three or four days to rewire that. So what we were doing was we were taking the wires and we were taking them off the side of the buildings and doing whatever we could to make this, make this happen and rewire it later. But that gives you an idea of the damage that occurred in that, that central office. Um, who would have thought that people would use a plane as a bomb? You've got to start thinking like the bad guys on the cyber side. You know, who would have thought that people would do some things like this? But they have, and so we've been forewarned, so we have to, we have to start thinking about what we want with the defenses. So we have a lot of uh, different types of operation centers. Um, this is a picture of actually the GSOC down in uh, Texas, it's a global security operations center, they do data loss prevention. So they're watching what egress is the network. Most people are watching what comes into the network. 
you also have to watch what feeds the network. Because it could be the most valuable stuff you have, just let the network. And at that point, get your resume up. Um, so it's, uh, it, it's really important to have uh, a pulse on your network. Uh, so we do some stuff like that. It's a plug for Stu Jacobs, who wrote this book, Engineering uh, Information Security. He's a uh, professor at Boston University. Um, he wrote a pretty decent engineering book. Uh, and all of these uh, appendices in the back of it uh, has some really good samples if you have to write policies or write an RFP or things like that. So um, in the bigger slide deck that I did, he had a lot of graphics. And so I gave him a bigger plug. But I didn't do any other stuff except for this one slide. This is. Network security. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all of this stuff here because I could talk for three hours on just this one slide. But the reality is these are some of the layers of defense that you would use. Right? Um, uh, not, no one of them is going to stop the bad people from getting in. However, you do need these layers because if you don't, they're just going to come walking in. Right? So you need firewalls, you need routers, you need uh, whitelisting, blacklisting, you need uh, intrusion detection systems, you need load balancers, you need denial of service attack, which has been a big thing in the paper. The financial sector has been hit hard with it. They're going to go from the financial sector, they're going to go to the electric sector. They're going to go to any sector that they want as hacktivists and keep on bugging uh, because they know that this type of uh, attack does work. So just before one, think about denial of service, understand what it means to your business. You know, if those web servers you have on the front end are really valuable to your business, think about that layer of protection on that stuff. There are services you can buy to mitigate some of it, um, but they get pretty sophisticated. And to, to let you know how denial of service works from a carrier point of view, you buy so much bandwidth. Just like on your cell phone, you buy so much uh, data uh, per month and, and speed like that. Or if you're files, you buy so much a month, they have 30, 30, 30 upstream, 30 downstream. When you go beyond that capacity, then we have to make a decision. Do we let you have that extra capacity or not? Well, when you're using an edge router, there's probably 130 other customers that are using that same router. These are the routers the size you know, refrigerators, they're big, big routers. To support like 130 customers. And um, if you are taking 50 or 60 percent of the bandwidth beyond what you paid for, we have to make a determination of are we going to really hurt the other 129 that are out there. Um, so if you buy a mitigation service, we can take that traffic and move it somewhere else and not hurt those other 29. If you don't, then we have to make a business decision to keep that router up and running uh, because it's going to reach capacity very fast. Those are decisions carriers have to make when these types of attacks are happening. So from a business point of view, think about it before it happens. You know, what are you going to do? What do you want us to do? Because if we drop your traffic, the, your internet connection is gone. So, but as a, as a company, we have to try to keep the internet up. So it's, it's, it's a real balancing act that happens. Secure protocols, <coughs> anything that starts with an S is a good thing. Uh, except for XML doesn't have an S in it, but it has some security. Um, anything that um, that sends passwords in the clear is a no-no. Why? Because they're already inside the network. You should send their own clear passwords. Guess what? They get the admin passwords. They get any passwords that they want. So you have to assume they're on the inside. So you use secure protocols. Why? Because you make it hard for them. All right. These are some of the algorithms to use um, if you're going to use encryption. Um, this could be a whole three-hour talk just on encryption, but it's, it's, it's important to understand it. We use just encryption on laptops. Um, Things like that. Yeah. You still want to use this? Uh, triple disk probably is better. Yeah. It gets out there. Uh, uh, AES is probably uh, a pretty good way of going. It's uh, broken a long time ago. Oh, I know. But there's a lot of older technology that still uses it. I know. So we have systems out there that are 50 years old, 30 years old. So, so sometimes you have to be backward compatible to so some of these older algorithms. They're still out there. They're better than nothing, but. But Microsoft stuff, sometimes they try to shut them off and then your system's not working. They call those features. <laughs> um, if you say, why do I want to tell my developers to use secure protocols, these are some of the reasons. For instance, ask them questions like, well, what countries are you going to have this data stored in? Or move this data, transfer this data back and forth from? Or um, what are the laws of the land that you're using for stuff? Um, what kind of perform performance do you need? Is this data sensitive? If it's not sensitive at all, you may not have to protect it. This is all public knowledge. But as soon as it becomes someone says it's sensitive, it has a social security number, it has a credit card, it has healthcare information, um, it has financial information. At that point, it's sensitive, it needs to be protected. It needs to be protected, the rest needs to be protected, the transfers. 
to transit because someone could be just listening. They didn't get into that financial system. They're waiting for people to send stuff out. Right. So use that checklist. Uh, application and software security. A lot going on in this space, but people have lost track in, in protecting the operating system and all of the other stuff that, that they've forgotten about the application. The application is really important. And uh, the reason why they're important, uh, one of the things that we're looking at is um, do I have the right uh, level of roles for the different people? In other words, if the person only needs to do backups, can they do backups and read writes and everything else, or can they just do backups? Um, is, this person just needs to have read access to the application. Uh, do they have read and write? Why do they have write? Do they need write? Because if the bad guy gets their account, they have both read and write and keep set and match. So, so think about those role stuff. You also th think about throttling. If I can only do 50 transactions an hour and I just did 5,000, that's way beyond what I should be doing. That means someone's probably running a script and probably someone trying to do something really bad, whether it's an internal employee or someone on the outside. <coughs> they don't know what the rules are, so therefore, that should be alarmed. Okay? It may be that you're, we're in a disaster situation and we've run some big tools to try to get the network up and run the late 911, but the reality is in most cases, people can't physically do any more than that, so therefore, a machine is doing something really bad. So, so think about that when you're building applications. What is abnormal and flag abnormal from an application point of view? It's another layer of defense. Don't forget it. Database security, it's a very, very complex area. There probably was no talk in here on it. Um, I was amazed when I was talking to someone from Oracle. They came in and talked to me about database security for about half the answer. Well, this is a big area. This is really complex. The reason why it's important is because they're going after the databases. It's just the same reason why they go after banks, because that's where the money is. Well, the databases have all the critical information in your company, critical information about your customers. That's what they want. So think about protecting it. Your database administrators have to be well trained on phishing and, and the, the latest security threats, and they have to do a good job of protecting their password and watching their privilege and access. Because they're just waiting for those guys to make guys and girls to make a mistake. Uh, let's say that you have most of your critical information up by our sales force. Um, is there any other things that we should be doing about protecting ourselves? Well, I really wouldn't put too little critical stuff on sales force to begin with, if that was my company. But um, cloud computing is a whole different topic. Um, I, I would. I, I would lean people's more towards using private clouds versus public clouds, especially if you have sensitive information, because the, the jury is out on whether the clouds can be protected with real sensitive information. If you're encrypting everything and things along those lines, it's going to make it more difficult for them. But um, I would just be leery of putting real sensitive stuff out there and think about that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the data breach report, let's go through a few things. The things in red are the most important things. So who gets attacked? Everybody in this room. Okay. All industries, the tactics are numerous, the tactics are non-stop. You should start every three minutes, you know, if you're lucky. I could be faster than that. State affiliated, 19%. So you're up against nation states who have lots of money. Okay, so 20% are coming from nation states. And guess what? Um, that is, um, that's up 10% from last year. All right, so, so you're dealing with people that have Lot of billions of dollars that are willing to take your stuff. So, you know, small, medium businesses, they don't have the, they have the money to work, for these, work against these guys. So, um, who are these people? They break up, they, the report breaks them up into activists, which are doing a lot of the denial of service attacks right now, uh, criminals, and spies. The spies are the ones that are the well funded ones, the criminals are the ones that are after the financial stuff that they can sell real fast. Five minutes from now. And then, um, what are some of the tactics? Uh, they are, uh, activists are very basic methods, criminals are in between complexity and the spies, whatever they want to do and whatever they want to take. Uh, they could be trying for three to five years to do that. 78% um, of these attacks are discovered by the outside, not by you. And 69% by the government telling you you can hack, and 9% by your own customers. That's, a, that's uh, not much. Uh, not much faith in the people inside very at all. So um, if someone tells you that you, they think that you have a problem, you probably do. 66% uh, of the, case, of the cases um, 
who discovered it months and years. Oh, this is the one where last year was 56%, now it's 66%. So we're going the wrong way. So it's taking us months to years to figure out what we've been compromised. And it takes them um, minutes to hours to break in. So there's something wrong with that curve, and we need to fix that a little bit. This is really interesting. This came from a company, I think it's called, um, I can't remember. But anyways, they, they provided us some data breach report. They looked at 47,000 incidents um, of when they, they go out and they do spear phishing attacks on companies who pay them to come in and do it. So what they, what they found out was on average, at about three spear phishing emails, they can get over 50% to click on. And at 10, pretty much evening out right here, they're in. So they all have to do is send out 10, the same email inside your company, and somebody's going to click on it. And you're going to be infected, and the game's going to start, and you're going to stop moving laterally. That's not many emails. That's why the bad guys are using it. It's so simple. It's past your firewalls, your routers, everything else. Someone clicks on it, they're infected, all of a sudden, uh, you're in the network. So you can read these in recommendations. I just want to talk a little about securing home network. Um, all of these people are all breaking up with each other by texting. <laughs> <laughs> the young people, uh, what is it, like 80% uh, of the kids sleep with their phones, between 50 and 80%. So um, you may want to just grab them at night so that they, they can get good quality sleep. But, um, and you laugh because my daughter, her last breakup was over a text. Um, so, so it does happen. Um, so if you're protecting your home, think about these things, these next few slides. Um, what's your Ten minutes? Um, I was surprised. I went up to my router and I had 14 devices on. I didn't. I didn't include the average on a firehouse one was 15 devices. Uh, we haven't get into the toasters and the refrigerators, maybe because you can't patch them fast enough, probably if they have a problem. But, um, but then that gives you an idea. There's, there's there's a lot of things you can do. A lot of smart things you can do. These are some of them. Uh, as, as far as smartphones, uh, iPhones are a, a lot better protected from a malware point of view than the, the droids of the world. Android's operating system. We had about 150,000 right now Android malware attacks, and uh, um, the, uh, the smart, iPhone, smart iPhones are probably 10 or less malware, piece of malware. So, so if you have a choice right now, iPhone. Uh, however, what they'll find over time is that they'll find ways to get into whatever the most people are using. So it will come back with iPhone. But at least for right now, if you're buying one for the next two years, you may want the iPhone versus. I gave you a starter different one just to see how it worked out. Uh, phones do disappear, 3,400 last year. Uh, Boston was number 10. People just walk away from their phones and get off. Is any proprietary of your company information on those phones? It's gone too. That's a data breach. In a lot of cases, you've got to report. And you know those fines. So, so think about that. Make sure that if your people have uh, proprietary information on the phone, make sure it's encrypted. Otherwise, you're in trouble. Some basic things to do on devices in the home. Um, password protect, Wi-Fi, use WPA or WPA2. Uh, don't use web, it can be broken in less than 60 seconds. Okay. It's only for people driving by within 300, 500 feet. However, just don't do it. Let them go to your other neighbors, not your house. If you're living in there could be a lot of people. The high rise in, in uh, Boston. Um, just, just a quick note, um, you can go up to the site, please rob me. You're on Facebook, say, hey, what are you having a great time in Puerto Rico or Punta Cana, wherever you are, and we're going to be back in five days, and they just told everybody on the internet that's watching you that your house is ready to be robbed, and you've got five days to do it, so bring in the Google <laughs> These people look at the same information you post publicly, they look at it as, oh, this is an opportunity. So think about that next time you post something. You want everybody in the world to know where you are, what you're doing, who your friends are, all of that stuff. The answer is no. Tell your kids to stop doing it too. Because that's how kids can be uh, you know, socially engineered to meet someone somewhere or to uh, try to uh, compromise them at some event. Um, so think about it from a reverse point of view of, oh, this is good information to share. Is it the right thing if it's a predator? And uh, this gives you some more stuff for uh, protecting your home. So that's what I had. And Sticking to it. So, we've got one minute. Any questions? What email address will we send the email to you? David Dumas at White House does No. David Dumas at Verizon.
Bob got sorrow. Didn't sing him into the end. Yes. David, could you comment a little further on some other potential social engineering uh, things? Like, I, I, I know that fishing is kind of late one, but I'd like to think about that given the way the meaning of talks, because it's like the technical side, we talk more about the functional side. Can you comment a little further on some of those questions I'm going to answer? Yeah, basically, um, I look at social engineers as magicians. So they're using um, not magic, which is taking out your mind and your visual effects to do something to your can see. Social engineers are playing against um, how normally things work and using it in a different way. And um, they're very good. They can, they can get someone to give up. I'm from this bank. I need your credit card. The expiration date is a three-digit number on the bank. We're verifying your account. We've had a problem. We've had a break-in type of a thing. You say, oh, for those of you who need this stuff, so you track this guy down. And all of a sudden, your credit card's are going to work. They're very good at sounding like they're coming from a legitimate source and that they really need this information. And they're forceful in that you have to get this thing or we're shutting down. You have to get your credit card. You know, so, so someone is 80 years old and say, holy crap, I don't even know what the internet is, but I'm going to give you my credit card and all of a sudden they find the credit card. I don't know. You know what I do is I, I start to Google it and, and research it from that point of view. I've heard that the RSA conference, the RSA conference two or three or so years ago, and I haven't looked it up yet, there was a person who was going through different social engineering attacks and he had videos. And if you could find that person, that person would actually maybe go in and do the talk or, or show you the videos, but there, I know that there are people out there, probably you can you can probably see some social engineering techniques too, so I'd start with some of those. I have a question concerning certifications. Yeah. Uh, there are some sorts of certifications that are coming every day, uh, and they are not the right certifications. Uh, and uh, how do you work to hire people and who are probably living for the next five years? What's wrong? What kind of certification would be improved? Well, number one is CISSP. And it's not so important that it's a, um, um, you're going to learn a lot from it. But if what's important is that it says that you're a security professional. You have to have 40 hours of training per year and you're committed to the security field. That's what that certification buys you more than anything else. So I have a CISSP, I have a CISSP, I'm certified in social security. I've got that when I was in practice. I had coverage. But, um, the CISSP would be the one that gets you in the door more than any other one. What about for interns? If I'm allowed to have the interns in between, what about going to legal? Interns are going to be hard to find at the collegiate level just because a lot of people have the work experience to be able to do the CISSP. A lot of times you need to go to five years of experience and have that. So I would say um, uh, I would be looking at an aptitude in security, wants to be a security professional, maybe has joined uh, through a student chapter, a local organization. I know um, I, I went to talk to Clark University in Northeastern chapter, there's a student chapter for the ISSA. Um, I, I'd um, bring them in as interns if they look like that they have the savvy that they can do what you want to do because these kids are so smart nowadays and you mold them, see if they can try them out. They all need the opportunity, and we need more security professionals. So um, we can talk a little bit more if you want to. Send me an email, I'll give you some more ideas. Good. Okay. All right, we all set? Go for it.